Hello, everyone, and welcome to API Guys Helsinki and the North. I'm Jennifer Riggins. I'm going to be your cruise director. Hello, everyone, and welcome to API Guys Helsinki trip. and the North. I'm Jennifer Riggins. I'm going to be your cruise director. Hello, everyone, and welcome to API Obviously, Guys Helsinki and the North. I'm Jennifer Riggins. I'm going to your Okay, I'm going to start over. Thank you to everyone. And I apologize for those technical difficulties there. I'm going to start in one moment. I'm just going to make sure everything is stopped and then I'm going to start again. So thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to API Days Helsinki and the North. I'm Jennifer Riggins. I'm going to be your cruise director from the for the mobility and APIs track. Certainly, you could look at them as the chicken or the egg, which came first. Did APIs enable mobility or did the need for mobility require APIs? So I'm really looking forward to talking to Arun, Flavio, and Olaf. Please make my job easier and go ahead and ask questions in the chat and hop in. We really want this to be an interactive talk that you get the questions you want answered. So we're going to have 20 minutes for each of the three speakers, five minutes after to ask your tough questions of them. And then we're going to have a panel at the end. So just everyone take a moment, close your eyes, take a breath. And remember, look away from the screen sometimes, except those running the show. So thank you to everyone. I look forward to your questions. And please, Arun, come on board on breaking up monoliths and laying them to, nobody likes a pun better than the API community, laying them to rest. Thank you, Jennifer. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, and let me start with this quote, right? So uh, uh, even before I introduce myself, I, I, I really love this quote because uh, especially when you are breaking monoliths, it's it's a very difficult journey. Uh, the way I defi define monolith is basically an application which is probably generating revenue and profits for the organization, right? So if you are trying to break it up to break, make it a new application, the road is going to be difficult. But for sure, it's going to be different, better, uh, and fruitful uh, through the journey and at the end of it as well, right? So having said that, uh, my talk is going to be on breaking up monoliths and to lay them to rest, right? So uh, obviously any monolith uh, in the new world uh, to be broken down, you have to break it down, have good contracts between, between multiple applications and you're obviously linking them up with APIs and and the contracts that work efficiently, right? So that's sort of the topic that I have. The way I split this whole talk is going to be, uh, the first part is a little overview of the organization where I work. Uh, why I speak about it is to give you a context that uh, it's quite difficult for us to have gone through this, uh, through this journey. The second part obviously is giving you a very high level overview of what a monolith is. Uh, I would then go uh, with, a, with two case studies, logically, to say what are the different approaches that we have taken to break this monolith, right? And logic, obviously, I'll end it up with saying what are the benefits, how you could translate it into your uh, setup, how this would help you go faster in any kind of uh, uh, application that you might be owning or running, right? So that's that's at a high level. So first of all, thank you, uh, API Days, to have uh, brought me here. It's always a pleasure. This is my second talk for the API Days. Uh, and uh, for with Helsinki, obviously, and being virtual, uh, I hope you uh, find this useful. Uh, all that I can say is I'm sitting in a, I'm sitting in Bangalore where the weather is 30 degrees. Uh, so it's, it's certainly warmer than where Helsinki is. OK, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, I'm Arun. Uh, I'm, I'm a director of engineering. I take care of the DevOps platform, which logically means everything uh, that's, uh, let's say, uh, if you want to call an Azure platform, an in-house built Azure platform uh, for all the tooling is something that I manage for my own organization. So that's at a very high level of what I do. Uh, and more than that, it's what is important is the context in which I'm talking about breaking up monoliths, right? So uh, I work for Amadeus. 
Uh, it's one of the top 10 largest software companies in, uh, in the world. Uh, we take care of travel domain. So uh, if you have ever sat on a plane, you would have used our services behind the scenes, could be for baggage handling, could be for your PNR generation, could be for ticketing, et cetera, right? Uh, what this means, this is a 30 plus year organization. So we have built these applications to last. The stability has been uh, the prime focus for the organization. So what it logically means is we have built monoliths uh, and many of them to cater to this industry. And whenever we have to transition to the new ways of working, it's always more difficult to break this monolith into smaller applications, component, microservices, however you want to call it, uh, to take it to the next level, right? Uh, obviously, uh, the two examples I'm going to give is one which has been one of the uh, an internal tooling platform which caters to uh, all the deployments, anything that goes to production goes through that platform. The second platform is a validation platform, which does about 350 million transactions a day, right? So uh, I take these two examples and give you a context on how to break, break these monoliths. So in any kind of an enterprise, logically, when you look at it, uh, there were monoliths. I mean, if you think of any organizations 30 years ago, uh, these were monolithic applications. Probably uh, if, if you take our context, uh, we were on mainframes. Uh, we moved from that. Uh, monolithic applications to maybe slightly smaller monoliths, but still a monolith, uh, probably more of a SOA architecture. We started using APIs and then we are moving into the microservices, microservices model, uh, also enabled through cloud. Uh, but this is more, obviously, probably everybody on this call uh, is going through this journey, right? Maybe you've not started at mainframes but you started in the SOA based architecture and that, that's how you're progressing, right? Uh, having said that, what is enabling underneath, right? I mean, uh, when we were at mainframes, we were more at the TTY, uh, Edifact kind of messages. We moved on to sort of a little bit, we continued on the same messaging, but we also had SOAP and REST to aid it. Uh, obviously, when you're going to microservices, uh, we are relying very heavily on REST but we don't know what, what more is going to come, right? So uh, this is probably the setup of most of the organizations. And as I said, uh, this transformation is typically a long lead uh, anywhere between a 12 to 18 month process. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is more about what that journey is. To start off, obviously a monolith, I, I sort of touched upon at the beginning, Monolith is not just a very large application. It's probably the money generator, the cash cow for your organization. Uh, you obviously want to transform it uh, primarily because uh, you see there is value of it being a new, new generation application. If it was not, you probably would stop it. Uh, it's not just the application being big. It is also about, let's say, it's, there, are, there could be many different applications connected at a database. It could be saying different uh, processes and all needs to be built together. It could be different release cycles. For example, uh, you need to have a uh, release 1.1 of something and release 2.1 of something all getting combined together so that it makes an application. Or it could be the overall thinking or the mindset in the organization. I mean, everything could be monolithic. And if you see it, when you're breaking this, obviously the technical, there are, I'm not going to touch upon the uh, political aspect or the organizational structure aspect, considering this is an API talk, we are more looking at how to technically break up applications and what are the parameters that you use to break up applications. So obviously when you're thinking of breaking an application, this is more at a general high level. Uh, you're looking at breaking it either uh, break the code base, uh, you split one large repository into multiple small repo repositories so that you can run together. Uh, similarly, any of those technical angles or perspectives can be used, chosen, right? On the business aspect, which I touched upon, it is also about breaking a monolithic application to say, take out components which are not as critical. You, you probably take out uh, probably a reporting piece, make it a microservice. Uh, you uh, obviously don't touch the login piece, which could be the, uh, the entry point to your application, right? So uh, you could... Uh, you could split it, split a monolith based on business criticality, change frequency, uh, how frequently the product gets released, etc. Right? Uh, and obviously, the more economic part is: Do you want to split the hardware components? Do you want to split the component based on which generates more revenue, uh, which has less impact to business, etc. Right? So you you could use a plethora of things. And as I said, the uh, the aspect of technical 
in whatever approach you take, uh, the recommendation is to go uh, take the API first approach uh, in the sense you build the API and build the UI over it, not the other way around, so that so that the applications are built with the API first mindset. So obviously, in any kind of uh, breaking of an application uh, into microservices, the most idealistic approach uh, is what I said. If you have a monolith, uh, you could take the native SOA approach. You can break into the same monolith, let's say the API layer, the storage layer, and everything in between. Uh, you create multiple smaller components, right? Uh, but what it really does, it doesn't really uh, take it to the ideal scenario because it's not a switch and swap model. The ideal uh, microservices model that it's it's stateless you can uh, you can deploy or plug and play independently doesn't really work in this uh, in this mini monolith appro approach right so obviously what you would go to is uh, you have a good api layer that you have all the plug and play functionalities which could sit in the sit in between uh, these are all independent components and it could easily be swapped uh, in a way and format that we need, right? So this is logically extracting stateless services to help you in this approach. So let's uh, sell so two core strategies, right? I mean, I'll, I have one case study for each. One is the strangling approach, one is the breaking approach. When you're looking at a strangling approach, it's basically uh, you're breaking a monolith by creating new features, extracting new features out of it and uh, identifying seams, identifying edges that can connect via APIs. And over a period of time, you're basically shrinking the monolith uh, from a large piece, uh, you could call it a large monolith, to a smaller backend and over a period of time, shrinking it to a certain extent that it becomes probably a microservice, right? It's, it's a very long journey. And in, in, the, in the process of breaking, it's sort of a, uh, building a parallel application, right? I have an application A, I build an application B, and that there is one fine day where you say, okay, application A is shut down and application B takes over, right? And application B needs massive investment. You're running two parallel infrastructures for a very long time, and both have success methodologies in, in whatever way you choose, right? I mean, neither of them is a good or a bad strategy. And obviously, what is common to both of them is a co common governance model, right? Uh, irrespective of what uh, you say you are an API first uh, organization, the, the thing that I mentioned is when you're breaking, when you're asking teams to work in a agile microservices model, don't expect people to write different programming languages. Yes, they talk to each other via APIs, but then it's still good to have a co common governance model, which says maybe common set of tools, common set of contracts, so that it's easier to switch and swap whenever it's needed. I mean, it could be, when I say switch and swap, it could also be from a people, skill, uh, technology aspect, right? I mean, if there are unique teams writing in 200 different languages, so obviously switching to a new component means uh, rewriting that component in a particular format. So let's look at two, two examples as I uh, progress, right? So one of the first case studies I look at is, is an application which is a monolithic uh, application. This was the one that I mentioned. It was the, the one in blue uh, was sort of a monolithic application, which is the new architecture now. Uh, it does about 350 million transactions a day, right? Uh, so obviously it's not something that I can build in parallel, switch it and deploy. So the approach obviously was to start building newer components that you see on the right. And once the newer components is built, you have a router system which starts connecting to those, right? Uh, so I'll go through the whole process of how this was built. Uh, I, I am inspired by a blog, uh, which, which I have mentioned on the bottom right, so you could refer to that blog. Uh, it's, it's exactly what a monolithic to a microservices model is, right? Uh, so obviously when you're looking at this approach of strangling building an application, uh, look at this as a monolithic application has a big database behind the scenes and obviously all the modules are potentially co-developed, right? So the first approach that we took here or what you can take as well is to identify seams. I mean, what are the components that can be broken out? Uh, what are the components that needs to be uh, isolated? And what is the plan for the future, right? Uh, it's never a two, three month process. What I believe is it's, it's six to, uh, sorry, uh, a 12 to 18 month process. Uh, I take the... Uh, uh, never ignore the database, right? I mean, you can break the uh, break every component into microservices, but it's not stateless until you uh, work on the database as well, right? It's a hard journey. There could be organization changes too, and 
this is not where the APIs come in. I will sort of bring it into the next level. You start with the scenes. As I said, one of the easiest components to separate out is the UI component. So you decouple the presentation layer. Uh, the monolith probably remains as a monolith yet because most of the business functionality remains the same. Starting out small, so obviously start building UI components, which is uh, which works directly. Uh, most of the requests that are hitting the backend continues to hit the backend directly. But now there are new requests which are flowing through the new UI component and hitting the monolith. The interaction between the monolith and the APIs start building APIs around it so that that can be extended, right? And when, when, when you are saying APIs need to be built, these are obviously APIs which are to be uh, designed in a more secure and a flexible manner. Don't make it uh, API monolith where it's hard to change any of those, right? So moving on, obviously, when you look at uh, the seeds, you've started uh, initially, you kept the UI separate. Now you're also routing some of the UI components to the monolith. Here, uh, if you can't really start with microservices, this is an approach where you're breaking into microservices. Uh, whichever large functionality you can think of, separate it out. Uh, you also start building new functionalities in the monolith with feature toggles. Uh, these could be API driven, non API driven, but I would still say this is the core aspect of. Uh, strangulating over a period of time because the toggles enable you to switch, uh, or switch on or switch off the components. And obviously, while you are building this, you have built a new API layer, which is uh, which is new compared to the old. You also have a new UI component, which is bigger than the old. So the overall surface of a potential hacking attack is now threefold versus a monolith. Be aware of it while you are building it, right? And this is also an aspect where you are simplifying things and not complicating it. So just as we move on on the same path, uh, if you noticed earlier, we had kept the uh, routing of the backend, which still existed, which uh, if you notice, this used to be called the monolith. Now you call it a backend because now the UI takes over all the front end components. Uh, and then you, this is where you start of building inner sourcing, every conversation being API focused. Uh, this is also an opportunity where you, within your organization, run hackathons and say, okay, now Everybody can contribute an inner source model on how to break this backend into smaller components. Any new functionality needs to be built in an API first mindset, right? This basically eliminates any kind of downtime that you can think of. Progressing further, let's say in one of the products that I was explaining, we built a API, uh, you, we built a microservices which was doing most of the parsing. This was parsing those 350 million uh, uh, requests. So the UI would still not send it to the parser. You're building a small component which does this job. And once it's ready, you're also building a database which is independent for that, right? So this is where you're focusing on large scale API designs. You're focusing on components. Um, the, the, the backend still is working. So you're component, componentizing new functionality, right? So it is also potential option where you are taking the second approach of uh, sort of breaking the backend completely and building something parallel. So as we move on, we connect the dots. Obviously, uh, the parser DB starts talking to the database. The parser has a REST API, if you notice. So it has a REST API layer now. Uh, this is where uh, it gets very easy to start building back in the backend. You have to resist the temptation of not choosing the backend uh, for any new functionality to be built. Uh, build as new microservices. This is where you have to focus on the API designs. That's where you get flexibility of building the applications faster. Right. Uh, obviously, there are workarounds. Uh, anything that needs to be built, if you, even if a small component needs to be built, start with a microservices first approach so that you don't build that component in a backend and the backend becomes stronger and stronger instead of you weakening it as, as time goes. So obviously, this is the last phase where you're looking at switching it into the new application. Right. So uh, you have separated out the parser as an application. You have multiple backends. Uh, the ideal state is to put an API gateway in between so that you can easily uh, route the API traffic as, as, as needed. Uh, you have broken the database aspects into the database of the backend, database of the parser, and any new components that you have built. Uh, and obviously, this is where you start trying out the canary loads, right? So uh, segment the traffic accordingly. Uh, use your API gateways to route. Uh, uh, strengthen the security on this API layer as well, right? And this is what what gets more important here is the infra is sort of double. You're running two parallel uh, infrastructure. Uh, try squeezing out the old infrastructure as early as possible. 
uh, transform your applications into the new ways of working, right? So uh, obviously keep all the holes plugged on as temporary basis. This is where your um, the feature flags, etc., work in your favor. Obviously, when you enter the new world, uh, all the API gateway is rerouting the traffic into either the backend or the parser. Uh, the, the service becomes autonomous. Uh, any new component becomes autonomous. The backend probably is now a smaller component. And as and when you have uh, the indication is just a parser component, but this is where we had built about 150 microservices catering to this application and all being routed through uh, the um, uh, the API gateway, right? Uh, obviously, in parallel, it's important to run uh, transform into DevOps and agile ways of working uh, because now it's not one big application release. Uh, you could convince the product management, the product to say how you can be faster, more mobile uh, in terms of releasing faster, frequent, safer, etc. Right? So that's that's where you enter the new world. So this was obviously the case one where we took the approach of breaking components into smaller parts and using that in uh, running them parallelly and eventually diverting all of them into the new one right uh, the second monolith obviously this was uh, a big application doing about uh, 50000 releases a day uh, it it was a parsing application uh, which does all the deployments on onto the production environment it was a big application running engine so it any any change to this was very complicated because it had to go through all the security, compliance, legal kind of issues. So this approach was completely different where we built a parallel application uh, where there were multiple microservices, uh, some catering to login service, some catering to the uh, infrastructure as a service, etc. And then eventually a UI layer, which was probably common across all of these. Right. So it was uh, completely killing the application on the left and transforming it to a more microservices model on the right, right? So this is typically an application cost heavy, uh, uh, long lead. You have to trust the uh, trust the organization and the developers that you're evolving into that direction and sort of say, yes, there will be one fine day where you can switch to a new application. There will be a huge resistance, but the APIs and uh, the contract in which these work with internal and external organizations uh, play a huge role uh, in terms of showing agility and flexibility, right? So that's that's where this approach takes you to. Obviously, where we are in the in the six to twelve month journey, obviously both either of these applications we do about uh, two hundred times faster deployments. So we were doing once a quarter. We do multiple times a day now. Uh, as I said. Uh, in the ecosystem that we have, we have a million plus pull requests, which enables uh, these API uh, APIs help people build applications or inner source. They contribute it externally. You don't have to deploy a completely big applications on all, all application altogether. So it helps in that whole process. And as I said, this whole API gateway approach uh, has helped us in zero rollbacks. Uh, we have been running this application for the last. Uh, 18 to 20 months and we have had almost no rollbacks because we can easily divert their APIs to uh, to the old legacy APIs if needed, right? Uh, core things to remember, the architecture always comes first. Keep it loosely coupled. Uh, DevOps and API first should be your thought process. And most importantly, trust in automation. Small iterative approaches is the only way to go. Uh, if you take the big bang approach, uh, you need to be uh, cash rich you need to be trust rich. So uh, you need to be sure that it's going to happen on one single day and you have to focus all your energy on it. So uh, all this is very important as we progress through that journey. Uh, while I say this, uh, if any of you are interested in building applications, the APIs that we build are also externally focused. So you can use uh, these, these are free to use and you can build any travel applications for your own use or for your own business, right? So uh, that's that's where we are. So thank you. I think I'm well on time. Uh, I hope you took uh, valuable insights in what the approach towards uh, breaking monoliths is. And if you see the underneath foundation is the use of APIs and using all the automation principles that come along with it. So thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. I guess I have about five minutes to do that. Over awesome. to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Arun. That was really interesting. It was a really good overview of not so much your company. That was basically just an example, but the two ways you can break up a monolith. I found it very interesting that some of your terminology was quite violent, almost mm -hmm. like 
a, a monolith is this beast you have to slaughter. Like there's killing, there's breaking, there's strangulation, <laughs> terms like that. It, so it's it true, like but uh, it, it, uh, the, the bit is that's the money generator for you. That's that's the cash cow. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So you have to find a way to strangle it without destroying it. Without <laughs> killing it. But it definitely sounds like you had some wonderful outcomes from it very quickly. So you clearly believe in the Agile and DevOps mindset. You had a really great question from the audience that I wanted to ask you now, which sure. is... Jennifer, I can't hear you. Yeah, I went on oh, mute yeah. for no reason. That's okay. How the question in the audience is: How do you handle the deprecation of the public and partner APIs? How long are the sunset times that you typically use? Okay, so uh, uh, obviously a very good question. Um, we this has a lot to do with the communication, right? So we we uh, talk to the uh, the partner. I mean, it could be internal, external, because uh, others might have built this API which is connecting or others might have built an application which connects to our uh, API, but obviously they're relying on this to work forever. So uh, we try keeping uh, most of the APIs backward compatible, uh, at least uh, where, where they can continue to uh, use our old APIs. But then obviously you have a timeline, just like how we would say, uh, an application has a lifetime. We also give a timeline for the API to say, uh, this would get deprecated in six to twelve months. Uh, it's it is a complex, cost-heavy application, but that's that's where it is. But the the timeline I would say uh, ranges anywhere between uh, uh, depending on how large the customer is, uh, twelve to eighteen months. I would say. Well, again, Jennifer, you're this, on yeah. I don't know what's happening. This has been really helpful, Arun, and I'm sure we have, actually, I have definitely have many more questions for the panel. So thank you so much.